Hello everyone. Uh, today we will be talking about France and the crazy years. If you're wondering exactly what the crazy years are, uh, in France that's basically the French equivalent of uh, the Roaring Twenties. So we'll be looking at France uh, from 1990 into the 1920s. So where was France when we last left off? That's right, France won. France were the big winners uh, at the end of the First World War and with the help of, of the United States and with the United Kingdom, uh, France had defeated Germany uh, and in their eyes had wronged or corrected many of the wrongs uh, from the Franco-Prussian War of 1870. So France was in um, a relief mood certainly, but a celebratory mood as well. Paris peace negotiations, I mean, so, so France certainly played a central role in the peace negotiations in the wake of the First World War, and um, most of the peace negotiations took place in Paris, in the various suburbs of Paris, um, and the most important negotiations, those between the Allies in relation to what to do with Germany, took place at Versailles. Um, <clears throat> Versailles, of course, had been the place where the French, uh, or where the German Empire had been proclaimed in 1871. And indeed, negotiations opened on January 18th, 1919, which was the um, anniversary of the proclamation of the German Empire. So that, that kind of symbolism shows you just how much to a lot of the French government, this was about correcting the wrongs of, uh, 90, of 1870 and 1871. So the French play an important role in the peace negotiations. Um, one of the, but of course, one of the most important uh, contributors to negotiations is Woodrow Wilson, the American president. Um, he arrived in Paris in early 1919 for peace negotiations. You can see here he was widely celebrated by the French population, very much adored. Uh, Wilson saw him as a great hero, came to help help France in in its hour of need. Um, although, as we'll see. The French government wasn't always quite as um, endearing, quite as 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 fond of Wilson and his positions. Um, here's my first Jeopardy question for you guys. Uh, so, history by numbers: Woodrow Wilson's peace proposals to end World War One contained this many points, and you should all know the answer. What is 14? So, while actually the war was going on, Woodrow Wilson had issued what he called its 14 points for peace. Uh, what he hoped would be a relatively conciliatory um, approach to peace that would be hopefully satisfy all sides. So, um, it, it, and this, this was actually, of course, before um, the collapse of the German military uh, effort in, in the summer of 1918. Um, so Wilson kind of used, was hoped to use this as his starting point for negotiations. The Germans certainly hoped um, that, that some of these principles could be brought to bear on negotiations as well. The French weren't as keen on a lot of these. Um, George Clemenceau's famous comment um, was, I am part of Wilson and his 14 points, God himself had only 10. And that comment speaks in many ways to the division between, on the one hand, the French under Clemenceau, who really wanted to, um, in their terms, make the Bosch or the blockades pay, make Germany pay uh, for uh, the crisis. And Wilson, who was hoping to come up with a more lenient peace uh, treaty uh, that he felt the Germans could, to a reasonable extent, accept without much complaint. It's also worth bearing in mind that the peace negotiations took place in the context of what we would call the Red Menace. Uh, that is the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917, obviously had succeeded in, in uh, Russia. Um, but by 1919, there was growing communist and socialist movements across Europe. And there really was a very uh, strong sense that, some, that, that what had happened in Russia could happen in some other European countries as well. So that added to the kind of complexity of what the negotiators were facing, facing in dictating their peace to Germany. Here's a picture of the four, what were called the big four, the four main negotiators. So Woodrow Wilson, you should recognize on the right, Georges Clemenceau with a magnificent mustache next to him. Next to Clemenceau is David Lloyd George. And on the other end, um, on the left, is uh, Vittorio Orlando, who is the prime minister of Italy. Although in reality, it was really the um, the uh, the big three, the, the, the French, the British and the Americans, who did most of the peace negotiations. Um, so what was the attitude of the French government? There were divisions in French society about what approach should be taken. French socialists in particular preferred a, a, something of a more lenient approach. Um, but there were those in France who believed that you know as, as harsh a peace as possible needed to be imposed on Germany. They remembered, of course, that after 1871, the Germans had imposed a reasonably a, a harsh peace on France, and now the shoe was on the other foot, and the Germans wanted to return the favour. <clears throat> 
the most kind of outspoken advocate of this approach was Ferdinand Hoch, who we've seen before, who was the Allied commander, the French general who became the Allied commander in uh, 1918. He wanted, I'll show you here with the mouse cursor, this is the River Rhine, what's called the Rhineland, the parts of Western Germany to the west of the River Rhine that border France. He wanted France to occupy and essentially annex this Rhineland um, to, 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 to as compensation for uh, German um, uh what they saw as German aggression during the war. Um, it's also worth bearing in mind that, um, so and in the end, uh, Falk didn't get his way in terms of this measure actually being introduced, um, but the Rhineland, as I'll stress again in a moment, did become demilitarized. The other question was what would happen um, with Alsace-Lorraine? Hardly surprising, um, France wanted Alsace-Lorraine back, and what was the attitude amongst the ordinary people of Alsace-Lorraine? Yeah, many of uh, the, the people of Alsace-Lorraine want to be returned to um, uh, France, and they were as a result of the peace, uh, the peace treaty of Versailles. Of course, for France, the main issue was financial. Um, France had suffered um, enormously during the war. France had actually spent a lot of money. I think the, the statistics in the, in the lecture notes are France spent 16 times its annual budget over the course of the war um, in trying to uh, defeat the Germans. And now they wanted the Germans to pay. Um, and what was eventually kind of agreed was that 52% um, of all the reparations the Germans would pay to the Allies would go directly to France. Um, so France would get financial compensation in that way. Um, there were other concessions regarding um, finances. While France wasn't allowed to occupy the Rhineland, um, or at least to annex the Rhineland, the Saarland, which is also on the border between France and Germany, a very rich coal-producing region, France was to be given the profits of the coal production uh, from the Saarland um, for the next 15 years. Um, and so that was hoped to offset the cost of the war as well. There were also territorial concessions to the French. Um, the territories that... France had given to uh, Germany in Africa, and um, mostly here in, in, in this area, Western Africa, what became German Cameroon. They were returned to the French. So the Germans gave, or the French gave those territories to the Germans after the second Morocco crisis in compensation for the Germans ignoring the French annexation of um, of <coughs> excuse me of Morocco. And um, the French also received Syria and Lebanon to administer as well. That obviously wasn't French terror or German terror, that was the Ottoman Empire. But the French Empire actually grew as a result of the um, the, the peace treaty of Versailles. Um, other measures brought in to um, compensate the French. So the German military was reduced. They were not they were not allowed to have an army larger than one hundred thousand men. They were not allowed to have any submarines. They were not allowed to have an air force. Um, they were not allowed to have beyond small constraints a German navy. The Rhineland was also demilitarized. The idea was that French soldiers would occupy the Rhineland until 1935, and after that, the Rhineland would have to remain completely demilitarized. The, de the purpose of demilitarization was that if war broke out between France and Germany again, essentially France would have uh, you know, an undefended path directly into the center of Germany from which to strike back at the Germans. Um, so France, the, the treaty obviously it got in many ways to compensate uh, for the, the losses of, of, of the war, but it is worth reflecting for a moment just how severe the losses actually were the French suffered. So some statistics. 1.3 million Frenchmen were killed during the First World War. That was 1 in 10 of every adult males in France died fighting the Germans. In addition, another 300,000, the exact designation, literally the designation was mutilated. That is so badly um, uh, hurt in terms of lost limbs um, and other things that these men were simply unable to work. Another 1 million men were designated as partly handicapped who had as a result of their injuries, had lost some quality of life, and France was also left with 600,000 widows. So, um, in demographic terms, this was a severe blow to France. The, the war obviously had, had an enormous cost. Um, let's look at this demographic chart here. We discussed in an earlier class actually how the French birth rate had already been falling before the First World War, or the falling had been kind of stagnating. Um, and it falls during the First World War, and, and, and really kind of the the 
French demographics refer to these as the hollow classes, the hollow years where the French population really stagnates um, and doesn't grow at all. So you can see it's not until after the Second World War that France again begins any kind of dramatic population growth. Um, and, and so so if you look at the, the chart here, really between the 1860s, 1870s and 1945, there was not significant growth in, in terms of the French population. Um, France also suffered... Uh, uh, infrastructurally, um, I think the statistic was five million farmland, five acres of French farmland were put out of commission during the war. Some of those permanently, some of those had so many mines and chemicals leaked into the ground that they could never be used again for anything productive. To this day, if you go to Verdun, the scene of the epic battle from 1916, you will see signs saying, you know, do not leave the path. There are still mines lying around in the grass and, and uh, they're afraid that people might actually detonate them. And that was one of the, the, the reasons that the French people were so eager that the Germans be forced to pay heavily for the cost of the war, because their feeling was that most of the Western war in Western Europe was fought in France. It wasn't fought in Germany. Um, and there was severe damage done to the infrastructure of the northeast of France, which was one of its main uh, industrial centers. So the image you're looking at here is from the famous uh, Gothic Cathedral at Reims. Um, this is the image of it before the war. This is the image of the cathedral afterwards. So the cathedral at Reims had been occupied by the Germans, was destroyed during the occupation. And this was repeated you know, in large parts of northeastern France, considerable economic and infrastructural damage done. Um, and this encouraged many people in France to insist that you know, this is why they wanted Germany to uh, pay uh, for what they saw as Germany's crimes. So long story short, France wins the war. It does get some concessions in the peace. Um, in hindsight, probably doesn't get as many concessions it would have liked, but George Clemenceau was willing to compromise with Wilson in the belief that Wilson and the United States would remain as important allies for the French um, in, in, the, in, in the wake of any potential future German aggression. Um, as we know, in hindsight, that German, the, the, the Americans, after the United States Senate vetoes the plan to join the United Nations, does not uh, kind of withdraw from European affairs, and so this new ally that the French were banking on to help them keep the Germans in check was not there. And obviously, as we know, in hindsight, the kind of efforts to keep to restrict German um, military capabilities uh, proved to be ineffective um, in, in terms of, I guess, stopping the Germans when they began rearming in the 1930s.